Welcome back to another episode of 40 Facts About the 40K Universe. I am your host, Gersh1, and today we're going to be talking about the Archons of the Dark Eldar. If you're new to the channel, subscribe. We post Warhammer 40K lore videos every single day. If you have any suggestions, please comment down below, and if you enjoy our content, thank our patrons on Patreon. Link in the description if you guys want to support us. It's just a dollar a month. But with that said, let's get into 40 Facts on the Archons of the Dark Eldar. The Archons of the Jukari Kabul are the true lords of Kamara. They sit at the apex of the Dark Eldar hierarchy that controls the Dark City and the labyrinthian realm of the Jukari portion of the Webway. Archons tend to be the tallest and most elegant of their species. Their alabaster skin is corpse-like in appearance, for there is no true sunlight within their shadowy realms. Their athletic physiques are lined with whipcord muscle, honed and enhanced until they are superior to even that of their craftworld cousins. They stride through the fires of battle with the confidence and poise of a demigod, but their magnificence is only skin deep. Viewed with witch sight, dark Eldar are repugnant monsters. The flesh of their soulless selves is gnarled and cadaverous, while their eyes glow with an icy and maleficent hatred for all living things. Each one of these dark leaders is a potent foe on the battlefield, but he has attained his position not merely through martial prowess in the art of war and violence, but through consistently emerging as the victor in the most difficult game of all, the Byzantine intrigues that govern all things in the heart of the Dark City. Only the most insidious survive long enough to kill their way to the top. In both word and deed, each Archon is as poisonous as a serpent. Their minds are labyrinthian as the darkest reaches of the webway. Such traits are necessary, for to sit at the very peak of power is to make oneself a prominent target indeed. Though every Archon is a conceited megalomaniac, convinced of his own mental and physical superiority over all other beings, he will retain his position as an overlord of Kamara for only as long as he can stave off the endless coups and assassination attempts of his rivals, enemies, and his own Dracon lieutenants. One false move in the upper echelons of the Dark City is always inevitably fatal and so all Archons have an uncanny ability to predict the motions and schemes of others, and take great delight in turning their rivals' traps against them in bloody and often spectacular ways. Despite the elaborate network of alliances within the Dark City, the overlords of the Cabals run rings around those who seek to beat them at this deadly game. The endless ambitions of their underlings keep an Archon's paranoia as sharp as his own blade, and so it is in the service of treachery that all Archons truly excel their strategy stretching across the millennia as centuries-old plots come to fruition. It is said by some that the Archons of the Jukari could even teach Zinch, the Lord of Change, a thing or two about plotting for the long term. Some of the Archons, known as the Lords of Twilight, who govern from the highest spires of Kamara, even claim to have seized their throne in the time before the fall of the Eldar. These eldest of Archons view the rest of their species with contempt, as little better than squabbling children. The Lords of Twilight do not suffer fools willingly. A single misstep by one of their underlings in Protocol may rouse an Archon to murderous wrath. In matters of maintaining their Cabal's hierarchy, Archons have been known to even prefer solutions that leave everyone less well off, if only to spite them. Yet reveling in the depths of suffering and madness for an eternity eventually extracts a prize. Over the long Terran years that they have held the reins of power, or clawed their way up to hold this lofty position, the Archons of the Dark Eldar have enjoyed the pain of others for so long as only a true atrocity invigorates them. Archons regularly lead full-scale planetary raids for their cabals, as drinking in the agony of an entire planet is the only way they could regenerate themselves. Thousands of slaves must be sacrificed for the eldest Archons every single night, and this still may not be enough to make the oldest and most corrupt look youthful once more. As a result, Eldar Archons usually cover their black veined faces with masks. Some Archons' masks are stylized and beautiful. Others are bloody, alien, and terrible, fashioned from the flayed flesh of their rivals' faces. When the time comes for battle, an Archon will first stop at the Weapons Museum, savoring the process of selecting which of the baleful technologies of the Dark City, a soul trap, agonizers, or shadow fields he will use to visit terror and pain upon the unwitting. Some Archons choose a different array of armaments for each engagement, indulging in the variety at their disposal. Others have used the same tool of slaughter for years, decades, or even centuries, and continually find new ways to induce suffering with their favorite implements. 
Almost all Archons surround themselves with a court of favored retainers, pets, and bodyguards. From the looming serpentine mercenaries, known as slits, to packs of drooling, fangmawed orgules from the haunted pyramids of Shdome. Such a retinue can be as varied as the tools in the Overlord's torture chamber. Currently, the most powerful Archon is Supreme Overlord, Azurvale Vact. He is the ruler of the Cabal of the Black Heart, the oldest and greatest of his kind. It was Vact who rose from his mundane life as a young warrior slave to bring the old order of the Dark Eldar nobility crashing down and instituted the Cabalite system. So complete is Vact's stranglehold upon Kamara that none of these highly placed subordinate Archons dare challenge the Overlord's supremacy in anything but the most private dreams or fantasies. Even then, they do so with caution, for it is said that Vact knows well the scent of treachery and reads the minds of lesser mortals like an open book. Vect has also come the closest to fulfilling every Archon's greatest desire, to become one of the Dark Muses. The Dark Muses are truly powerful Drukhari from ages past, who have essentially become folkloric figures of reverence, much like the Imperium worships Imperial Saints. Worship of these beings started before the fall, sometime between the 19th and 24th millennium by the Imperial Calendar when the traditional worship of the Eldari gods began to wane, as new sects and societies dedicated to heathenistic excess began to rise in power amongst the ancient Eldari. Many of these dark muses epitomize a particular form of vice. For instance, the evils of arrogance are personified by the dark muse, Vileth. Vileth is particularly popular as an ideal to which many dark Eldar archons aspire to. The most famous followers of Vileth are known as the Scions of Vileth, and are known as the best aerial hunters of the Dark Eldar, piloting aircrafts such as the Razorwing Jet Fighters and the Void Raven Bombers. These Dark Eldar pilots will sometimes form mercenary aerial squadrons that will work for Cabals, Witch Cults, and the Homunculi of the Dark City. The emergence of cults centered around a particular Dark Muse or multiple Dark Muses is common in Dark Eldar society. For instance, there exist many mysterious sisterhoods who are desired by powerful archons to serve as courtesans in their courts. Known as Lemaeans, these female Trukari are renowned in Kamara for being both imaginative lovers and exceptional poisoners. They descend from the cult of Lymea, whose courtesan elite also worshipped the Dark Muse, Lilithu, and gained their knowledge of poisons from another Dark Muse known as Shamash, father of poisons. Such is the sisterhood's mastery that they can alter the poisons of others to enhance their effect, knowing how best to maximize a weapon's potency with a glance. Certain xenographers hold Shamesh to be a mythical figure, and others a historical one. The tendency for Eldar myth to blur the line between the two has not helped what studies exist on the topic. Whether this Shamesh was ever real, his influence lives on in the deadly bruise of his devoted followers. This is true for most Dark Muses. The stories of their heathenistic and twisted actions have existed since before the fall, and many tales have become more legend than factual tellings. Nevertheless, the Drukhari of Kamara continue to worship these beings and enact ever stranger rituals and ceremonies in their honor. Sacrificing is a common form of worship in the Dark Eldar culture. The majority of sacrifices to the Dark Muses take the form of human or other Xeno offerings. The quality of sacrifice also may vary depending on the fortune desired by the worshippers. Sacrificing a fresh slave compared to a virgin thrall that has already been subjected to horrible torture will foster different results. The most desired sacrifice will always come in the form of Eldar ritual slaughtering. To offer Eldari blood is seen as the ultimate form of libation. Traditionalist witch cults often seek the ritual favor of the dark muse, Kale the Mistress of Blades, with a sacrifice for good fortune before combat. Other witch cults evoke the favor of the Dark Muse, Hecate the Red Crone, before they enter any battle. Just like the Imperium, the Dark Eldar will go to great lengths to recover artifacts or relics pertaining to these ancient beings. Much like an Imperial priest might venerate an article of armor left behind by a famous general, the Drukhari revere the weapons or torture devices of these ancient Eldari. Inest is known to be a dark muse, particularly revered by the Cabal of the Onyx Scar. The Cabal searches for her ashes in the warp rift known as the Screaming Vortex in the Segmentum Obscurus, 
where the ashes are rumored to be held in a chalice on a pirate-held world of Sackgrave. Every single Archon is a master of his own race. Each wields enough political influence to collapse portions of real space into the warp, stall the progress of Imperial Crusades, or even take the population of an entire world as slaves. And in battle, it is rare when a warrior actually sees a Dark Eldar Archon and comes out alive. And those were 40 facts on the Archons of the Dark Eldar. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Thank our patrons on Patreon for allowing us to create new content. Uh, their dollar a month really does help out a lot. Um, a giveaway will be coming soon for all you guys who uh, participate. And again, link in the description if you guys want to support us. Uh, I'm going to be honest with you, the Dark Eldar is not the faction that I really care about in 40k. Uh, as you guys could probably see within our archives, we do very little Dark Eldar lore, and that is because, like I said, it never really like drew my attention, but now we have a Dark Eldar player in our group, and we're running a narrative campaign, so I want to learn more about the Dark Eldar. Um, based on the what I see in the Codex, they seem pretty interesting. I was really surprised at how many named Archons there are within the lore. You, they might not have, like, playable tabletop models, but they have a lot of, like, uh, Archon uh, guys. And then the Cabals, same thing. Um, it, it, was, it was a huge surprise when I, when I opened up the Codex and I was like, oh, damn, there's, there's a lot of these guys. Um, so if you guys have suggestions for any topics about the Dark Eldar, please comment down below. and We will continue to talk about them. So thanks for everything, guys, and I'll talk to you tomorrow. This was Gershwan with One Mind Syndicate signing out. <laughs>